Hi, my name is David Kenny. Welcome to Light from Above. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ in Wadsworth, Ohio. I also have a special guest with me, Brother Dave Miller from Apologetics Press from Montgomery, Alabama. Dave, welcome. We're glad to have you here in Ohio. Glad you could be on the show. Great to be here. Thank you. We've been uh, interviewing him on a couple programs in prior episodes. Uh, I thought we would take some time and talk about a newer book that you have, and maybe we can sort of dig in a little deeper on it and talk about it. And you can get the book through apologizepress.org. Um, it's uh, either it's soon to be out or is out. I'm not sure which one it is, but uh, it'll be available. It's called God and Government. God and Government. Dave, why don't you tell them, you know, give us a little bit of an overview, you know, what's this book about, basically the title? Well, it seems to me that we're living at a time in American history where confusion among our, our population at large and our politicians is very significant with regard to the role of government, especially the federal government. Uh, anybody who's been following what's going on, whichever side of the issue you're on, like socialism, there's no question that our, our government has has become large, it's bloated, it's taken on a lot of different roles and responsibilities. And uh, I just thought, you know, we need to go back and see, number one, what does the Bible say about human government? What, what is God's view of human government? Does he authorize it? If so, what is its purpose? And then also go back and look at the founders because they were the ones that orchestrated this grand experiment of the American Republic. What did they say and how pleased would they be with the role of the federal government that they established. So that's kind of the background of how this got started. Now, you know, just, just you know, to be real blunt about it, what uh, to, some people may say, well, what does God have anything to do with government at all? Which would uh, be a good question. That'd be a good, great question. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people say, well, God never endorsed any form of government mm. uh, in the Bible. I've heard people say that as well. But why don't you speak a little bit to our government, our federal government, and its relationship to God, as opposed to maybe some of these other, like socialism, communism, those okay. kinds of forms? Well, the premier passage, I suppose, in the New Testament would be Romans 13. I mean, that, that explicitly states that human government is ordained of God. And what's incredible is that he goes ahead and explains why. What, what is the purpose of government? And Paul articulates that very precisely he is to bear the sword. He is therefore responsible for maintaining order, uh, to protect the rank and file citizens, to provide uh, security uh, for people. So the, the purpose of government stated very succinctly is to protect its citizens from internal, uh, an internal criminal element and an external, uh, you know, nations that would want to harm us. Uh, there's not anything in the Bible about uh, God wanting the government to provide me with, you know, a monthly check or with um, uh, free health care or uh, even an education. You know, we've kind of come to expect that, well, that, that's really kind of the role of government. But the Bible places that at the feet of parents, not that they, they can't allow uh, a public school to assist them in that role, but it's not to usurp that role or take the place of that role especially if public education has become corrupted and is subversive to the republic because of the ideologies and concepts that are being uh, perpetrated on young minds. So uh, Romans 13, 1 Peter chapter 2, you know, that's the role of government. Uh, the way it's worded in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 is that we might uh, live peaceful lives. Well. After looking at those passages, I went back to the Old Testament to see, well, does God say anything about this? Well, as it, as it so happens, there is only one civil law code in all of human history that God Himself authored, and that's the Law of Moses. Now, while the Law of Moses certainly addressed a lot of what we would call religious features, when you think about it, Israel came out of Egypt and began, commenced their national identity. And the law of Moses was intended to be the, the governing law code. In fact, you remember uh, Moses, uh, through, God actually said through Moses uh, there in chapter 4, right, right, off the, right out of the chute in uh, the restatement of the law in Deuteronomy, what nation is there that has a God like we have? Well, there weren't any others. They were all pagan. Mm -hmm. 
And what other nation has a law code like we have that, that comes from the mind of God? So when we want to look at a civil law code, there would be the one to go to. And I discover that's exactly what the founders believed. They often spoke of the Ten Commandments and the Hebrew Code. Not that they thought the Ten Commandments were still in effect as Hebrew law. They knew that was not the case. But they were saying, look, these moral uh, statements constitute the proper foundation on which any successful government and country will be built. And so I found both the founders saying the, purpose, the central purpose of government is to protect the people, and I found the Bible says, says the same thing. Let me, let me ask you about this, the, uh, talk about principles. Um, the law of Moses was for a nation, nation of Israel. You quoted a passage in Romans 13 that talks about the sword. Now, some people look at it and say, well, you know, our context, our day and age is different and all that. Okay, but principles still follow. Mm -hmm. Why don't you explain to people when the, the New Testament, when Paul wrote to the Roman, to the church at Rome, when he says the sword, I mean, we don't carry around swords very often, what, does he, what did he mean to them, and what would that mean to us today? What, what authority, as far as the sword, how would that relate to our day? That's an excellent question. The only purpose for which a sword was used, that, insofar as I know, was for the purpose of execution. You know, it wasn't to uh, spank people or to tickle them under the ribs or anything like that. The sword was an instrument of lethal uh, execution. So that is an explicit endorsement of capital punishment. But again, well, let's go back, though, to the one civil law code that God himself authored. Did capital punishment play a role in the mosaic economy in terms of the punishments, the punishment framework out of which God wanted that nation uh, to conduct itself? Well, as it turns out, that was probably the premier form of punishment. There were others, uh, flogging, uh, fines that could be levied. There was even uh, banishment. But the number one way to address crime, according to the Law of Moses, was capital punishment. And I discovered that there are no fewer than 16 capital crimes under the Law of Moses. Uh, one, for example, that uh, we ought to be following, and we're not, is uh, kidnapping. You know, we have children, for example, kidnapped in this country every day, uh, taken away by perverted people that sexually abuse these children and, and literally destroy them. If they, even if they ever get out from under their captor, they're essentially ruined for life. Well, that was a death penalty offense in the mind of God. He wanted execution on that. And I think about murder. Think how many premeditated first degree murders occur in this country every day. And the perpetrators uh, go to death row, uh, sit there for years and years and years, appeal their cases. The, the law of Moses said not only is the death penalty to be invoked, it's to be invoked speedily. And there is no, uh, the law of Moses said no ransom is to be taken for the first degree murderer. Well, that's our modern equivalent of plea bargaining. And we'll plea bargain and, and get it down from the death sentence and go sit on death row. By the way, the, the biggest eye-opening discovery to me under the Law of Moses was incarceration was not a punishment that God gave. Putting people in prison and letting them sit there for 30 years is not in the mind of God. That's not part of God's will. Uh, they had a temporary containment holding cell while what we would call court was taking place to ascertain guilt or innocence. But that's not one of the punishments. And so how dare we utilize punishments that God himself does not authorize us to use. But on the matter of murder, uh, by taking ransom, by delaying punishment, the text indicates very clearly that that is going to cause, it, it will be a major contributor to the unraveling of the moral uh, condition of the nation. That's how serious that is to God. Now I know in, uh, in the state of Ohio, we've had a lot of uh, uh, politicians talking about and in the press about human trafficking mm -hmm. and how you know it's a big problem. There's a lot of things that we rename, uh, but they're old. They're old crimes. Absolutely. And you, know, you talk about incarceration. I believe archaeology talks about in the ancient world, you will not find 
prisons mm. uh, in archaeology because they didn't do that kind of a thing. They usually went to capital punishment if they had right. to do that. But uh, and we, we, we know that uh, take sexual predators, we know that the recidivism rate, the repeat rate of that, mm -hmm. it just keeps going on and on mm -hmm. and on. Matter of fact, uh, in where I live, I get an update from the county sheriff, mm -hmm. and it tells me every new sex offender that's been released in my neighborhood. And if you pull that up on a map, you'd be afraid to go out your door. Right. So our government has, you know, let us down, at least where I live, has let us down in doing one of the things you're talking about, and that is keeping society safe. Yeah, so here's our government doing all kinds of things, imposing all kinds of taxes and, and all of this, and then the very thing that they're supposed to be doing, they're neglecting and allowing to get completely out of hand. Under the law of Moses, notice if, if God wanted merely a kidnapper to be executed, which by the way, is wrong because it infringes upon one of the unalienable rights that God has given us. You have a right to decide what to do with your life unless you so violate the law that you forfeit that right. Well, a kidnapper is somebody who's coming and taking charge of your life and deciding uh, what is to be done with your life. Well, that, that's a death penalty offense. So imagine if God did not, if He wanted a person executed because they simply took custody of a child that they had no right to take custody of. Imagine what he would want done to the person who would sexually abuse that child. And yet that's going on all over the country and uh, it's being handled very lightly. And as you say, as a result, they are permeating our civilization where sexual predators are in large numbers. Well, we've brought this upon ourselves because we think we're more compassionate than God. We think we know how this ought to be handled instead of going back and seeing exactly how God wanted it handled. Well, and also they, they've made us prisoners in our own houses. Absolutely. And that's really, sa that's really sad. Uh, we're talking about uh, Dave Miller's uh, book, God and Government. Um, let me, let me, let's talk a little bit about, you know, we talk about forms of government. But let me, let me you, you said a word, and I want to sort of flesh out this word. Uh, a lot of people think that our nation, even people of our own citizenry, they think that our, our nation is a democracy. And they, and they think that means that our nation is, take the federal election. They think that, oh, you know, uh, we're a democracy, every vote counts. And then you have something that called a republic. You mentioned the word republic. Mm -hmm. And some people don't understand the difference between, and I know it's more complicated, but they don't understand the fundamental difference between a republic and a full democracy. Could you explain to people the difference between those two concepts as it relates to the United States? Sure. You know, the founders were very clear on this. When you go back and read through their literature, you rarely have them refer to a democracy. And when they do, it's generally very negative. A democracy is simply ruled by majority. And they said all the democracies throughout human history have devolved into um, uh, self-defeating, uh, very wicked uh, countries that end up imploding. A republic, on the other hand, is a representative form of government where the people rule themselves, they govern themselves through their hand-picked elected representatives. But the entire superstructure sits upon certain unchanging norms, values, truths, moral principles that come from God. See, in a democracy, uh, today, the people may say uh, homosexuality is wrong. It's a crime. And then tomorrow, they may vote and say, no, now it's okay. Well, you can't have that. That, that, that will tear a civilization apart. So there has to be these, these unchanging values, which they said came from the Creator, the God of the Bible. And so our, our government must fit hand in glove with those moral principles and be rooted and based upon those, and all of our laws must therefore be in harmony with that. When somebody tells me, oh, you know, God doesn't specify a particular form of government. Well, if you mean by that, he doesn't explicitly say, okay, I want a republic and, and all these other governments are wrong. That's true. But when you study the Bible and see what political form of government fits hand in glove with Christianity, it's the republic that the founders themselves set up. And certainly God, even though we may say that um, 
you know, well, he doesn't condemn a socialist government. He doesn't explicitly state that's bad. No, but when you study the Bible and see how God feels about socialistic principles, you'll see exactly where he stands on that. Now you mentioned uh, Republican, you have elected officials, uh, and those elected officials, they represent you, they represent us. What, you know, for a citizen, how important and what should a citizen be looking for in these representatives in government? What kind of qualifications would God expect us as citizens to look at when we're selecting mm -hmm. uh, a, a card of candidates? What, what things would be important for us to look at? I was astounded at how many passages in the Old Testament express that very thing. The people obviously should select uh, righteous people that believe in God, that believe in the moral principles upon which our country was founded. Uh, they need to be themselves personally moral people. You know, I've heard people say in the last few presidencies, well, you know, their own personal morality, uh, we need to leave that aside and, and focus. Well, that's, that's ridiculous. If a person lies in a regular basis in his private life, you don't think he's going to bring that into his public life? If, if he's a thief or if he's greedy and selfish, is he not going to use his political power to accomplish that? Look at the dictatorships of, of the world in our day and throughout history. That's the way they operate. The people at the top feather their own nest, enhance themselves. You know, our own Congress has voted itself numerous pay raises. So the founders said, okay, if you put a lot of people in government, then you're going to reap what you sow and you deserve it. Instead, you should be inspecting the moral and spiritual uh, standing character of the people you select. They said this over and over. And then they need to be people that are not only principled morally and spiritually and religiously, and by the way, do they go to church? <laughs> you know, 60% of Americans don't even go to church anymore. So they're not going to be looking at whether these are religious people that believe in God and think that they ought to restrain themselves with Christian principles. Do they go to church? Are they, and are they savvy? Are they people who understand the principles of government? It's clear to me that most of our politicians, if you ask them that question, what's the difference between a democracy and a republic? They'd look at you with glazed eyes. They wouldn't know what you're talking about. And they regularly use the word democracy as if that's what we have, which I guess we pretty much do now, but that's not how it was intended. Well, you can really see it in the, uh, not to be too political here, but you can really see it in the debate um, or even past debates, uh, elections like Gore versus Bush, or the last one, you know, uh, Clinton versus Trump. A lot of people are going around and saying, well, she won the popular vote, or he won the popular vote, you know, regardless of the numbers of it. And people go around, they say that, and, and I'm like, don't you understand? They obviously have no idea the concept. They think that we're a democracy, and they'll rail against the Electoral College and they're actually railing against the republic when they do that, is my understanding. Is that close to what's right? I would say so. There's some complicated features as to why they brought the Electoral College in. But, uh, and certainly by voting, you know, the founders set it up as um, a situation where, you know, votes count. But uh, the problem that we're facing in our country is that, in fact, uh, again, the founders repeated this over and over tragically, um, if, if the quality of our political leaders has declined, that is an indication that the moral condition of the population has declined. The politicians are a reflection of the population. So there's our biggest trouble. There's our problem. We've got people now that are, you know, in the, in the last election, there were candidates that would just come out and say, I'm a socialist. And that's where I, you know, well, 50 years ago, he never would have made it to first base. He wouldn't have even been considered by Americans. So we have widespread abject ignorance about uh, what, what should be, what are the values that brought us to this point in history. And the very people that are trying to tear down our nation and say that it's evil, it's wicked, it's racist, uh, would not last two minutes in the, the, the society that they would like to have and there are plenty of them around. Why don't they go to those societies? Why would they want to? Why would they think that changing this one will enable them to continue to have the prosperous lifestyle that they're enjoying? Well, I know it's another way to look at the debate too about you know, right and wrong, immoral, moral. Uh, there's definitely a lot of confusion. I want you to talk about this topic next, and, and that has to do with immigration. 
immigration in our country is a nightmare politically and, and every, just about every, politically, economically, in every form. Mm -hmm. But people don't understand, you know, they, they, they want to co-mingle two forms of immigration. They want to say that everybody that wants, people want to come to this country and you know, if they follow the process, then they, you know, they should be allowed to do that. Well, I think everybody agrees with that. Hmm. But the debate is about the people that come here illegally, and then you actually have government officials who have sworn to uphold the law, who haven't upheld the law, and now they're actually even advocating further erosion of the law through this immigration. Why don't you talk a little bit about illegal immigration a little bit? Well, notice right off the bat, you've said it well when you've indicated a lack of respect for the law. The rule of law has taken a severe beating in our nation in the last 50 years, and it's because we've raised two or three generations, beginning with mine, baby boomers, that don't respect law. And therefore, we're rebelling against God, we're rebelling against uh, past American thinking on this. So there's your number one problem. But with regard to immigration, if you look at, at immigration law going all the way back to the founding, most Americans apparently are unaware of the fact we've always had them, even as every other nation has had them. If you want to look at a very strict and rigid uh, immigration policy, look at Mexico's. Just go Google it and look at what they require. They require things that we do not require. But the further back you go, the more careful and serious Americans were. And the founders made it very clear. They said, you know, hey, we've got a big country here that's unpopulated. We welcome people from anywhere. However, we have set into place this republic that depends upon certain basic values. The majority of our people share a common religion. Our people share a common language. These are indispensable to maintaining a republic like we have established. You know, if you want a dictatorship or a monarchy or something else, those things don't matter. But if you want a republic that's self-governing, then the people have to be well-educated and they have to agree with these basic principles. So logically, rationally, you start flooding your country with individuals from locations in the world that do not share those values and those principles of government even. What are you going to do to your country? I mean, this is just rationality. Do you know what the liberal elements seized upon with this, with their thinking? Well, you guys are racist. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you want uh, white Europeans, not uh, black Africans. I'm telling you, David, that is an absolute falsehood. They never said such a thing. I remember Benjamin Franklin when he came out of Independence Hall and they asked him, what kind of government do we have? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. If you can keep if it. If you can keep it. Yeah, there's uh, definitely some uh, threats there. So see, they, they would say that we welcome people from any nation, mm -hmm. but we, we're going to tend to prefer the ones from nations that share our values, that understand our principles. So would they welcome Muslims into our country? I believe if the founders were here and you lined them up to a man, they would say, well, yes, you know, we're not against anybody as far as, you know, ethnicity or anything like that. However, uh, the Quran teaches that a man may have up to four wives. Now, we can't tolerate that here because this nation was based on Christian values, one man, one woman for life. So that is immoral. And if we try, if we allow immorality to come into our country without putting a stop to it, it's going to erode the foundations of our country. Uh, Islam has a history for the last 1,400 years of uh, wanting to kill Christians. I mean, even if people today want to deny that and say, well, ISIS is an anomaly, that's no, no. Look back over 1,400 years, going back to Muhammad's own lifetime. They have been warlike and violent. And so, would we allow them to come to our country if they won't be warlike and violent and they won't practice immorality? The book is God in Government by Dave Miller. Uh, you can get this from apologeticspress.org. Uh, Dave, thanks for sharing this, uh, with us some information about this book and being a part of our program. It's been great to have you. It's been a joy. That's all the time we have today. Thank you for watching our program. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. 
or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map, don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people, or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And that and the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind too that in Noah's day there was a big flood and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. In this world we